Okay, our discussion right now is about body fluid disorders. I guess I'm labeling this heart six in the uh, sequence. Body fluid disorders, there's a lot of them, but of course in this introductory type material, we'll introduce a few and then move on. The first, first thing I want to say is albumin is important because it's a protein made by the liver found in the blood. And it's responsible for maintaining blood volume. If you remember when we were just a couple lessons ago, previous to this, we talked about how fluid leaves capillaries by hydrostatic pressure on the arterial end of the capillary and then on the venous end fluid tends to come back into the capillary by osmosis and that osmosis is really governed by albumin. So then if we have hypoalbuminemia. So let me help you with that. Hypo is a prefix that always means low or below. Albumin, that's our root word. We just talked about it. It's a protein made by the liver. Emia is a suffix that means blood. So this word literally means low levels of albumin in the blood. That means the osmotic pressure that draws fluid back into the blood vessels isn't going to be as high. And therefore, we will tend to get edema. And edema is a general term, and it really is a swelling from excess accumulation of fluid, you could say serous fluid, in tissue. And then things get puffy. So then we want to talk about edema. Well, edema is excess interstitial fluid in a tissue. And so then we have a couple of illustrations. Here's one of a dog. And if you look at the rear legs of this dog, I think you can be convinced that those legs are puffy. There's extra fluid contained within the tissue, and that's the definition of edema. This dog happens to be female, and it's not apparent from the image, but the reason for this edema was because of a mammary tumor. It was obstructing the flow of lymph back to the heart. Okay, so let's get rid of that image or move it out of the way. And then bring in this term called pitting edema. And edema is, you know, excess tissue fluid excess interstitial flu interstitial fluid that's a hard word to say interstitial fluid and pitting means if you push your finger into the tissue the imprint of your finger stays for many seconds later or after so here's a human leg on the left the person is a applying pressure to their leg. On the right, the finger has been removed, but there's still a depression, hence a pit and pitting edema. Okay, now if you happen to be a cow person, I'm not sure how many people out there are cow people, but here's a cow with a couple of cases of edema. It's a very good, actually, picture. And you know this is the 
right side of the cow. Here's the mammary gland here. And you can see, and you may not be familiar with this, but this enlarged area here is usually not there. And so this would be called utter edema, utter, U-D-D-E-R, utter edema. And then this area here, which you might call the chest area, a lot of times it's better called the brisket. And so there's edema in the brisket, brisket edema in this case. Another disorder is dehydration. And if you remember, we've said that about 65% of the body weight is water weight. So 65% of the body weight is water weight. So in a 100-pound dog, you'd have 65 pounds of water. Amazing. Well, but that's normal. Let's go to a little graph here, chart, that shows what happens when we don't have all the water we need. Down at the bottom, it talks about if you're dehydrated by 3 to 5 percent. That's 3 to 5 percent dehydration. The mucous membranes get sticky. That's like if you lift up the cheeks of the animal and look at the mouth. They're sticky. Then at 5 to 8, we're going to show you a little thing about tenting. If you pick up some skin and you make a little tent in an area where you can, and if it stays longer than a couple seconds, we call that tenting. Tenting. And it's a loss of skin moisture. Then the eyes get sullen or sunken at 8 to 10%. And then you can see where the corneas get really dull at 10 to 12 percent. They forgot their dash. And then very weak pulse and tachycardia, that's rapid heartbeat when there's more than 12 percent dehydration. And then if you lose more than 15 percent of the water, then you basically have a dead animal. Okay, so that's a little chart. Let's show some things. Well, what does this figure show? It shows a dog with diarrhea. Do you know diarrhea is one of the main causes for dehydration in an animal? If you get the fecal material moving too fast through the digestive tract, it doesn't get to reabsorb all the water back into the body, and the water is lost in the fecal material, and that's going to lead to dehydration. <clears throat> so, you need to make sure your dogs, in this case, get a lot of water. I've had dogs that I trained to drink out of a water bottle or a gallon jug. And it's pretty handy because when you're traveling, you can stop and get a gallon of water from Walmart and go out there with your dogs, and they're going to lap up. They're not going to wait for a bowl. That's pretty handy. Okay, yes. This is the tenting, tenting, T-E-N-T-I-N-G. When you lift up the skin over the neck area especially, and then you let your fingers go, if it stays up in a raised condition, that's called tenting, and that's a, an indication of dehydration. Okay, and then finally, I brought this sh Sharpe up because I thought, gee, can you even do a tenting thing with this animal? You lift up the skin, and I'm not sure if you can tell if the animal is dehydrated or not. So it's kind of like a little bit of a dilemma. 
Now we're on to another disorder of water balance. And it's called ascites. A-S-C-I-T-E-S. -E ascites means excess fluid collected in the abdominal cavity. Okay. So let me show you a couple of pictures of that. Let me get rid of the word here or move it up there and show you ascites in a dog. A side view, you could say a lateral view, and obviously, hopefully you can tell that's abnormal. The dog's not pregnant. You got water in the belly, basically. And if the animal is positioned so it's standing on its two back legs, you get this bulging appearance. That's ascites, excess accumulation of fluid in the abdominal cavity. Here's another case where you can stick a needle into the abdomen and actually get fluid collected into a vessel if you wish to do a something with a diagnosis here. Notice the hand pressing on the abdominal cavity. That's going to help expel fluid. Now this fluid is not coming from the intestinal tract. It's just coming out from the outside of the intestinal tract. So I've got one more picture here. Let me get rid of this one. And again, this shows that this fluid is pretty much free-flowing. This is a needle, if you can't see that. This is the abdomen of the animal, the ventral aspect. The needle has been placed into the abdominal cavity, and we're not protruding the needle or sticking the needle in the, into the intestinal tract. This is like the free surface of the abdomen. We've already collected some in a syringe. Looks like about 10 cc's. Yeah, something like that. And then the rest we're just letting to flow on the table. And here it says greater than 500 mils was removed from this animal. That's a lot. Okay, that's a half a liter. Now another body fluid disorder is called a chylothorax. This is a kind of a special case where lymph or very fatty lymph collects in the thoracic cavity. Now that's interesting because the thoracic cavity has the heart and lungs as we've learned previously. And you should remember, or if you don't, learn it now, that all the lymph collected from the body goes back in lymph vessels and will dump into very close to the vena cava in what's called the thoracic duct. And if this thoracic duct is leaking, then it's going to leak into the thorax, hence the term chylothorax, if that's what's happening. Relatively rare though, I may add. So here we go. The fluid, I'll enlarge that, is milky because it's fatty. And this just shows five different bottles, I should say, tubes of fluid that were collected by thoracentesis back here. See where I'm doing that? Thoracentesis. Whenever you say C-centesis, that means something was drawn out by a needle. Thoracentesis. We punctured the thorax with a needle and syringe and we drew out something. And that's what we've got, these five different tubes. Okay, let me get rid of that one and just give you a little bit more summary of the chylothorax. It's a milky fluid due to lymph and fats. 
it leaks from the thoracic duct. And if you remember, the thoracic duct is the final pathway of lymph that's being returned from the body and it's going to be dumped into the vena cava, basically. So there's some damage maybe to the lymph vessels, some of obstruction as well, or trauma. And the common causes of why you would have chylothorax, which remember is kind of rare, traumatic, maybe after a surgery or an injury, neoplastic, that means basically a cancer, there might be a disease going on, infective, or there might be some tumor that's involving this duct and it's not letting the fluid get back into the blood. Now, finally, another body fluid disorder is hydrocephalus. There's that word, hydrocephalus. Cephalus is head the skull, the brain area. Hydro means fluid. So this term, hydrocephalus, literally means fluid on the brain. Okay, let me get rid of that or put it back over here or right there and show you some images. Some of these are not pretty, but you should know this happens. And if hydro, hydrocephalus happens in a very young animal, when the skull is still growing, then you have a skull deformation, enlargement of the skull. If it happens after the skull has totally solidified, ossification it's called, then you'll get like depressions in the brain itself, and it may not be obvious on the outer aspect of the animal. Most of these I'm going to show you are the skull has been moved or deformed. Here we go. This looks like a foal. I'll enlarge it a little bit. That's obviously not normal. And this in red, I'm outlining with my red laser pointer, is the enlargement of the skull due to excess cerebrospinal fluid, it's called. Let's do this one. Here's a dog, a young dog, but you can see that skull doesn't look normal. Ends up being, I know, a little history of this dog. The owners took it in to the veterinarian after they saw the skull formation. I think they abducted they adopted the dog from a shelter, took it into their local veterinarian, and the prognosis was not good. It was going to have some, obviously, cognitive defects, and prognosis was life was not going to be too long, so they ended up euthanizing the animal. That's always a tough call, but in that case, that's what was indicated. Here's a cat, hardly looks like a cat, or at least the skull you can tell is not really right, rounded. I do not know the prognosis of that cat or the eventual uh, outcome of that case. And unfortunately, this happens in humans as well. As you can see, this beautiful young child has an enlarged skull and it's hydrocephalus due to excess co collection of what's called cerebral spinal fluid. And we'll, when we do neurology, we'll talk about cerebral spinal fluid. But there's always fluid in the brain. There's always some added and some taken out. But there's always a balance. And when the balance is thrown off and you get more accumulation, than you should. Then you get hydrocephalus in a young animal. You can see it on the skull. In an older animal, it will deform, push on the brain, but it won't change the skull uh, shape. Thank you so much.